So it's a very nice pleasure to have you here with us today. I know all of our audience in Cannabis World Journal and our global magazine is going to be very excited to read about your experience. Um, it is an honor to have you by the end of the year, especially since we are uh, expecting um, to put you in a highlight in our magazine. And since we are doing a recount of all the great uh, people that have interceded in our industry throughout the year, this is just gonna be the top on the cherry for us in the magazine and especially our readers. So let's get started with our first question. Now, um, as we well know, you've been in the cannabis industry for approximately 20 years or more. Now, um, this is just a basic overview. Where do you think cannabis is headed? What roadblocks are still left to overcome? And what surprises can we expect, particularly, let's say, in the close future or in the next three years? What do you think? Well, you know, what we know is, is, is that after decades and decades and decades of very little progress on legal reform of cannabis laws, in the last 20 years, we've seen a worldwide movement take hold. Uh, today, cannabis is legal in many places around the world, including uh, fully legal in 12 U.S. states, fully legal in Canada, fully legal in Mexico, many other countries around the world. Colombia is getting there step by step. So is Mexico. Um, uh, where we're headed, cannabis is going to be legal globally everywhere. And I believe that that's going to happen within the, the within your lifetimes, uh, maybe not within my lifetime, but within your lifetimes. And the reason for that is, is simple. The, the world really cannot afford to continue living any, any longer without this plant. Um, for thousands and thousands of years, the cannabis plant provided human beings with medicine, with food, with shelter, with clothing, with transportation with almost anything that we needed, as well as spiritual and mental sustenance and nourishment. Uh, and it's only been in the course of the last really several hundred years, and, and, and especially in the last hundred years that you saw us turn away from cannabis, that's going to change and, and we'll re-embrace it. So cannabis will be the backbone of the global economy and it will be the most valuable product on the planet. As I'm sure it will be back and with a vengeance because everything we've investigated so far, it's just, it's an amazing plant. And we, we this is what we're trying to do, bring awareness of the plant. So thank you very much for that answer. Now, um, I know that in the recent years, uh, we've, as you say, um, straight away from, from uh, the legalization of cannabis, but we've always used it. Now, um, if the government were to regulate cannabis in the United States, do you think um, they understand the industry well enough, uh, let's say at a molecular level, cultivation level, or a scientific form, to be able to intelligently set up a national federal protocols? Do you think a task force should be implemented? Do you think they need assistance? Um, in implementing these laws and understanding the whole benefits that cannabis has? Well, it's a great question because now if we assume and we believe that cannabis is going to be legal, the question no longer is, will cannabis become legal? The question becomes, how will it be made legal? Uh, how is the new industry going to be organized? <clears throat> Who is going to control it? Um, how will workers be treated? Is the industry going to be sustainable? Uh, what is uh, all of the norms, all of the standards of this industry are now being debated. And it's really a, uh, an incredible opportunity for the cannabis community and, and for people in general, because most industries um, uh, happen in, in back rooms, they happen in board rooms, they happen in meetings with bankers and conference rooms. Most average people don't really have an opportunity to participate in the building of a new industry. But with cannabis, it's different because it requires the changing of a law. And for those of us that live in countries that are at least supposed to be democratic countries, uh, where we're supposed to have political rights and can participate, we all have an opportunity to mold that industry and, and, and see how it's going to turn out. So 
Um, what I believe is that it's uh, we have to use this opportunity and make sure that we don't just build another industry, but that we build a new kind of industry. And, uh, and that's an industry that welcomes diversity, that welcomes inclusion, that builds equity and sustainability into everything that we do, that, 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 that spreads prosperity and opportunity much more widely than most existing industries do. Mr. John is the Jones. government capable of doing that? No, I mean, the quick answer is no, the government's not capable of doing that. Um, we don't need, you know, what we've learned in the cannabis struggle is that we only get what we fight for. Um, and that if we want good policy, we have to craft that policy and we have to really aggressively push for it and work for it and struggle for it. Uh, that's the only way that it happens. The government has been looking at cannabis for a lot less time than we have. And the people within the government are looking at it usually through some other kinds of lens. How much money can they make? How much power can they retain? Um, uh, so for those of us who love the cannabis plant, who understand its real potential to transform uh, human life and to transform the planet, um, we need to take that knowledge. We need to take that love. We need to think very, very carefully about how to make sure that the industry we build manifests the lessons that the plant teaches us. It's our responsibility and we can't, nobody else will do it if we don't. Mr. D'Angelo, thank you so much for that answer. Now, you know that this industry involves billions of dollars. Do you ever fear, especially when you talk about, you know, the shape of the industry that we're trying to forge here, do you ever fear it might be monopolized? I mean, there's so much money involved and so many different sectors involved. What do you think about that? Well, we're already seeing a corporatization of cannabis in many of the earliest markets that legalized, particularly in my home state of California, uh, where a really tragic situation is unfolding. Uh, the Most of the people who spent the past 20 or 30 years of their lives building the cannabis industry, the activists, the small farmers, the growers, the breeders, those of us who really cared about the cannabis plant, since the legalization, quote unquote, legalization of cannabis in 2018, for the most part, we have been squeezed out of the industry and new corporate players have come in who have been financed with huge amounts of money coming out of mostly the Canadian public uh, stock exchanges and markets. And these companies have come in and they're just, um, uh, on the one hand, they are uh, eating up all of the all of the uh, other existing companies and, and taking all of the space in the industry. On the other hand, they're not doing a very good job. <clears throat> uh, so nobody is being uh, served uh, very well by the situation in California, and it, it's it's why I, I said what I said in the in my prior answer. Uh, the we can only expect from corporations the same thing that corporations have always done which is to try and grab a bigger and bigger and bigger share of the pie and leave less and less and less opportunity for everybody else. The only way that that, that, that doesn't happen is by cannabis consumers, by people who love cannabis, engaging in the political process and insisting that regulations be written that, that spread prosperity more broadly. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. In the United States, in the state of Florida, there are 10 licensed cannabis companies. They uh, are allowed to have an unlimited amount of cultivation of uh, manufacturing and retailing of cannabis, but there are only 10 of them. So each one of these companies is a huge, huge corporation, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars uh, in capital in that corporation. There are no small legal farmers in, in Florida. There are no small legal manufacturers in Florida. That doesn't exist. In New York, <clears throat> which has just legalized cannabis and is, is they have not issued licenses yet, but taking a lesson from what's happened in Florida and in California, they've created a license type, which is going to allow a small grower to grow up to 5,000 square feet, about 1,500 square meters of cannabis canopy, and then directly sell that cannabis to retail clients. 
um, that would create many, many, many more small growers in New York and spread the opportunity much more widely than what you see in Florida. <clears throat> so those are the kind of details that people who care about cannabis are going to need to immerse themselves in as cannabis is regulated as this new industry is being created. That's amazing. Thank you very much. Now, um, to bring it more uh, into a local light, especially for our readers, we have a lot of readers here in Latin America and Colombia. Now, we know, um, as you said, you've taken a global approach when it comes to shedding light on cannabis, cannabis industry. However, we know you took a special interest in Colombia. Now, why this country in particular? What did you learn uh, while you were here on your travels? Well, Colombia, um, I've always had a special connection to Colombia because the, the, the very first, well, a little bit about my history. I fell in love with the cannabis plant when I was 13 years old. Um, I immediately became a cannabis activist and a cannabis entrepreneur. I started selling cannabis to raise the money to fund my activist activities. The first cannabis that I got that I really made a significant amount of money on that I really loved was uh, Santa Marta Gold and Punta Roja from Colombia during uh, La Bonanza Marimbera. So <laughs> I was in the United States as a young man on the receiving end of La Bonanza Marimbera. And, uh, and I'll never ever forget the amazing, amazing cannabis that I experienced from Colombia. Like nothing that I've ever experienced before or since that I still think about to this day. And, and so I had a, a special connection because I loved that cannabis that came from the land of Colombia. I had a special connection because that cannabis helped me make the money that I needed to start changing the laws and getting our movement started in the United States. So I always, uh, for years and years and years, hoped that I'd have the opportunity uh, to visit. And I was so, um, so happy that I, that I finally did get that opportunity in 2019. That's amazing. Now, um, we do have a lot of amazing strains that are just um, native to here. Now, I know that one of your main efforts is to bring legacy to legal. And Colombia is a perfect example of a country that has this type of history. Do you see it being implemented in this country? In Colombia? Yeah. No. I mean, it's, it's really tragic what I see happening in, in Colombia. In Colombia, you know, the, the politics of cannabis are, are enmeshed in the same politics of land and, and, and money and power that Colombia has been struggling over for years and years. And unfortunately, from my perspective, what's happened in Colombia is, is that the elites who have been running Colombia for decades and decades and decades have uh, taken the lion's share of the legal cannabis industry and put it into their own hands. And they've created a classic neo-colonialist economy where uh, they're just producing raw materials and shipping them off to Europe to be made into value-added products. Uh, and meanwhile, you have people who have been living in conflict zones who were supposed to be people who were able to start participating in the legal industry who are being denied licenses because they're indigenous people, because they were in conflict zones. And this is, in my view, you know, completely contrary to the way that the peace accords were supposed to work. The whole idea <clears throat> was that you would welcome people from conflict zones into the legal industry and allow them to grow crops legally so that they wouldn't need to arm themselves and, and get into battles with each other. And so now this, this policy on the part of the government to take all of the industry for the elites in the cities and leave nothing for people in the countryside is um, it's, it's, it's just more of the same. And I, it's discouraging because I love Colombia so much. But until, until the people at the top of the food chain and the pyramid in Colombia learn how to share and learn how to love, um, there's going to be a real problem. 
Now, uh, regarding to Colombia and uh, U.S. relationship, now do you think there's a future um, in exchange, let's say in a cultural um, training, learning, business, export or import opportunities? Because we're growing uh, as an industry and as well the U.S. has already been established. But do you think there's a future relationship and a future exchange that's possible within the U.S. and Colombia in the cannabis industry? Yes, but Colombians need to think carefully about how they want to structure that exchange, because, again, it will fall into the classic neo-colonialist paradigm where Colombia is used as a source of raw materials um, uh, and is really denied the lion's share of the of the money that's to be made in that relationship. So my wish for Colombia is that instead of really looking to form strong alliances with American companies and, and become appendages of American companies, that instead that Columbia uh, create a more broad-based cannabis industry that has the ability of giving birth to many, many different farmers, to many, many different brands, to many, many different types of products. I think Columbia has such a great already existing global brand in the world and has already such a great story to tell with cannabis. It already has such great cannabis and such great cannabis culture that that it that it's it's Colombian products and Colombian brands that should be on the market. It's not Colombian weed that should be used as an input for American brands. And I think that I think that there's a possibility to happen, but it only happens if Colombians make it happen. The Americans won't. No, I completely agree. It's a shame when you take a look at like the latest laws and you know, trying to bring that legalization to the industry. Only 10 percent. Um, so the latest law says that, uh, you know, everyone who's in within the industry and is selling uh, cannabis has to at least have 10 percent of that cannabis come from small uh, producers. But that's very little when you consider the amount of people that could benefit from the industry. And yet, it seems that we're already invaded by Canadian companies who are taking their share of the cake and, you know, leaving the local growers who have been, you know, using the plant for many, many years, but within conflict zones out of the equation. So there's still a, a long way to go there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way that I look at that is that 90% of the legal cannabis industry has been reserved exclusively for very large uh, highly capitalized mm -hmm. corporation and and that's just that's just outrageous it's not i don't think that that's the way that cannabis legalization was sold to the colombian people i think the colombian people embraced cannabis legalization because they saw it as a pathway to peace and and 10 percent is not a pathway to peace 10 percent is a pathway to continued conflict Yes, not very representative. Now, um, this has been um, a story that has been repeating itself in most countries. Now, legalization um, of cannabis has been very controversial and it often tends um, to, let's say, in Colombia, impact negatively on minorities. And the same has been going on in the United States with certain um, laws that has been um, that have been very strict on let's say um, the small minorities and the small uh, companies that are trying and small growers that are trying to get ahead. Now, um, you founded the last prisoner project and now one of the federal proposed bills is to expunge criminal records for nonviolent related cannabis crimes. Now, do you think that this will be a reality in 2022? And what are your thoughts on this project, if you could enlighten us? Well, we've, I, we've been, <clears throat> We've been making a lot of progress on expungement. Um, the, the state of New York, when they uh, just legalized cannabis, uh, included an automatic expungement provision. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, expungements at the state level in many different states. Um, so far, we have not seen expungements at the federal level. And, and, and this is really a kind of outrageous thing because our current president, President Biden, repeatedly when he was running for president said that he didn't believe that anybody should be in prison because of cannabis. And yet today in the United States of America, there are 40,000 people still in prison on cannabis charges. And many of them <clears throat> could be released immediately um, and have their records uh, totally expunged forever. But 
uh, but the current administration is is not moving on it, unfortunately. Uh, I think that in the United States for the for the next two and a half or three years until we have a new presidential administration, most of the progress is going to be happening at the state level. I don't I don't have a lot of hope for progress at the, at the federal level in the United States as long as Joe Biden is president, because put very simply, Joe Biden really hates cannabis. You don't think even with the, because if you want to take it from a really capitalist approach, if it's legalized at a federal level, banking would be a lot, a lot easier. And there's, you know, there are so many economic interests involved in the industry. Um, don't you think maybe they will push forward for the federal initiative, even if it doesn't come from a noble point of view, but just a purely capital one? Um. I, I, I think that there's a big difference between the stakeholder group that Joe Biden re represents and, and what you would call big corporate cannabis. Um, Joe Biden is just against cannabis, period. He just doesn't like cannabis. He's an old man. He built his career on alliances with pharmaceutical companies and law enforcement groups. He's always been the one of the most right-wing guys in the Democratic Party, almost like a Republican. So he's he, the only time he ever said anything positive about cannabis was when he was running for office, and, and that was simply a lie. Uh, so um, I, I think that there are there certainly are people in the Senate who would be very happy, and in the and the House of Representatives would be very happy just to pass the Safe Banking Act and no other legislation. <clears throat> but that group does not include Biden. So you have three groups, right? You have people like Biden. He's a total prohibitionist. You have people who really support a more corporate vision of legalized cannabis. They're very interested in passing the Safe Banking Act. And then you have people like me who are interested in, in using cannabis legalization as a way to create more social justice in the United States. And, and, and we are looking at for legislation that does that. All right. Well, um, that is um, truly a shame because um, it is something that, again, it gets repeated over and over in time. We get promises throughout campaigns and then we don't really get um, a development of these policies. But um, to um, change a little bit the subject, because we are very excited on everything that you've accomplished. And uh, on our opinion, one of the most beautiful works you've accomplished has been the Art View Group. Could you elaborate on the process of creating this and the development of this project um, for our readers? Yeah, the, the Art View Group uh, was launched in 2010. That was four years after I had started the Harborside Dispensary Group, which became very, very successful, got a lot of media attention. We were one of the first six licensed cannabis businesses in the United States. And, and as um, more attention uh, got shown on us, I was in more newspaper and television articles, I started having two groups of people coming to me. One were other people who wanted to start cannabis businesses or, or had cannabis businesses, but they needed to find investment money. Uh, and the other were people who had money who wanted to invest into the cannabis industry, but didn't know how to find the deals, didn't know how to evaluate the risks, didn't know how to make it happen. And so it was really clear that that it was uh, there was a need to create a venue, an arena, a place that these two groups of people could come together and, and get to know each other. And um, it's been a very interesting process. Um, since then, uh, ArcView um, grew into one of the top 10 angel investor networks in the United States um, and, uh, and has deployed uh, close to $300 million to over 200 different companies. So um, relatively small amounts of money to a lot of early stage uh, companies. And the, the thing that I like most about ArcView is that um, we, we always um, have provided a way for companies to meet investors uh, without having to spend a lot of money to do it. Um, there's always been a, an ArcView, a, a peer review process so that even companies who 
don't have money to be able to buy a sponsorship to put themselves in front of investors to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, that is amazing. Now, um, well, of course, you must be very proud of the entrepreneur and pioneer of all time. And for your creation, Harborside, could you tell us uh, what the factors and the elements for this great success? This is something that... Um, we always ask our interviewees because um, the factors of success, let's say the special ingredient, um, it's something that um, because we all start out small, but then we can get to something big. But uh, what would be your factor, the factor of success for the harbor side? Well, I think what made harbor site successful is that we always tried to uh, to listen to the lessons that the cannabis plant teaches us and to take those lessons seriously and to implement them into our business model. So, you know, one of the things that this plant teaches us is to be kind and to be generous and to care about the people who are around us. And so from the beginning at Harborside, we always understood uh, the surrounding community that we were a part of as part of our stakeholder group. And so, you know, when we first moved into, into our building at Harborside, there was a, a lot of crime in the neighborhood. Uh, there was a lot of garbage uh, that was on the streets. Um, there was a lot of gun violence that was happening. Um, uh, there were schools that didn't have uh, enough money to really properly educate their students. And we started working to solve all of those problems. We you know, sent crews of, of employees and volunteers out to help pick up garbage along the streets. Um, we, we had our security guys not just patrol harbor side, but also patrol the neighborhood. So then crime uh, went down. Uh, we um, donated money to buy guns off of the street in, in, in gun buyback programs. Um, we um, opened a free holistic care clinic uh, where we provided free yoga and, uh, and uh, other holistic therapies to people from the neighborhood. So we, we took that lesson and, and it ended up being you know, very, very valuable for us because um, uh, it wasn't too many years later that the federal government came to Oakland and tried to close Harborside down and took some you know, very serious legal actions against us. But because we had been kind to the community, because we had understand so the community as one of our key stakeholders, the city of Oakland filed legal action against the federal government um, uh, in, order, in order to stop the federal government from shutting us down. And that's one of the reasons that we were able to survive. Great, thank you very much. Now, um, you've said before, um, in regards to the Colombian perspective of it, that um, it's not something that's gonna move forward very fast unless the Colombian government decides to let's say share a piece of the cake. Now, um, we focus a lot uh, here on education because um, what's been the, the growing um, tradition within South American, Latin American countries has been very cultural, has been passed down a voice to voice and has had a sort of a religious and cultural component to it. Now we are uh, expanding the um, education in Latin America about the medical benefits of cannabis and everything that has to do with a more technical type of growing of cannabis. And um, let's say the, um, the pharmaceuticals of it so that our we don't uh, repeat the story of just becoming um, a source of origin for um, the base material so that we can also start investing in um, developing um, more holistic products. Now, do you think education will be a vital part of getting the Latin American industry and the South American industry to grow or um, would it be just politics? I think that education is important. Of course, it's important. Um, but at the end of the day, what's going to determine the shape of the industry and how equitable it is, how sustainable it is, how inclusive it is, are the regulations that are going to be written that structure that industry. And so, um, yes, education, but activism, engagement, understanding. It's not enough to just understand the plant and how the plant works and, and what an amazing plant that it is. 
Um, it's also necessary for those of us who care about plants, uh, cannabis to understand regulation, the different types of regulations, the different regulatory approaches um, for us to think very, very carefully about what we want to see this industry become and the best type of regulations to write to make it make sure that it gets there. If we want an industry that, that grows cannabis sustainably, we can have one, but we're going to have to have regulations that demand it. Otherwise, it won't happen. You know, if we want an industry that spreads prosperity and opportunity more widely rather than concentrating wealth more narrowly, we can have that, but only if we demand it, only if we come together, because the the, the standard story, the powers that be, the way things always operate, it's not going to come from that. It's only going to come from us engaging in this regulatory process with the same kind of passion and the same kind of determination that we have to, to, to make cannabis legal in the first place. So first, you know, will it be legal? But then how will it be legal? It's just as important. I completely agree now. You've talked about, um, you know, that there has to be, of course, the activism part, the, the regulation and uh, to create an industry with equal opportunities. And you have been you, you have been around long enough to see what it looked like before it was, you know, when it was completely outlawed and now that it's been, you know, uh, progressing and, you know, the legalization part is there. However, yet 80 percent of the market still goes to the black market. How do you think we can change this in the future? Is it just a is it just a thing of making it legal, or is it prices? Is it? Is it I mean, how, how do we how do we get that number down to incentivize people to go the legal route instead of you know the dealer on the on the block? So what you know, we've learned something very interesting in the course of, of the last few years, uh, which is is that that if you do not invite the legacy cannabis community, the people who have been carrying this plant through the dark years of prohibition into the legal industry, <clears throat> and you try to bring <clears throat> a corporate industry on top of that legacy market without including it, you end up with a complete disaster. Like my home state of California, where the legacy market is four times the size of the legal market. And the reason is really simple. When regulators started regulating cannabis in California, their attitude was, we're going to eliminate the black market. We are going to root out the underground market. Um, and, and they created uh, a series of requirements for licensing to get legal licenses that made it impossible for people who were in the legacy community to participate in the legal market. Uh, they were just too expensive. They were too difficult. There were too many regulations that you had to comply with. Regulations that didn't make any sense, that were not necessary. In California, cannabis, a natural healing plant that never killed anybody, is regulated more heavily than radioactive nuclear waste is. Um, and, and so the legacy community was not able to get licensed. At the same time, they put taxes. Uh, um, uh, outrageous taxes on cannabis. So, and if you go into a legal dispensary in California, the price of the cannabis is going to be 50 to 100% more than it would be if you bought it from a guy who's standing out on a corner on the street. And, and there's lots of people standing on the corner in the street selling weed in California. It's not hard to find. So it's really simple what happened in, in California. The regulators overregulated and made it impossible for legacy operators to get licensed, and then they overtaxed. So consumers, after quote-unquote legalization, walked into the expense rate. They saw these outrageously high prices. They ran out in shock <laughs> right into the arms of all of the legacy operators who have been unable to get licensed. So it's a very predictable result, and, and the reason is that they didn't welcome the legacy market in. This is exactly what's happening in Colombia today, and the result will be exactly the same. Um, if you do not invite the legacy market into the legal market, the legacy market will stay and keep doing what it's been doing for the past 50 years, 
And because it doesn't pay taxes and it doesn't have onerous regulations to comply with, it will outcompete the legal market. I, I, I agree on that. And um, well, you know, cannabis is a highly regulated industry. Many times it has been tried to be compared with the alcohol industry. What do you think about that comparison? I find it sometimes a bit inaccurate. Well, um, I think that it, that in, in most places, cannabis is regulated and taxed much, much, much more heavily than alcohol is. The, the rate of taxation on California for cannabis is many multiples the rate of taxation for alcohol, which makes no sense because alcohol is a much more socially destructive substance than, than, than cannabis is. So um, I don't think that it's accurate to say that cannabis is being regulated like alcohol. It's being regulated much, much, much more heavily than, than alcohol with, with, horror, with bad consequences. I also don't like the uh, comparison of, of cannabis with alcohol because I think they're, that they're qualitatively different substances. You know, uh, alcohol is a nerve poison. It is an addictive substance. It kills people. It, 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 it induces reckless and violent behavior. It's responsible for a huge amount of death and mayhem. Uh, all around the world. Uh, cannabis is a healing plant. It's never killed anybody. It tends to make people more thoughtful, more peaceful, more gentle, more kind, and more generous. So, you know, to compare alcohol and cannabis in the same breath is just a kind of a ridiculous comparison. Now, um, everything you're saying here about the plant, there is um, currently a very huge uh, opioid pandemic going on. And we know that um, this is because over um, formulating of painkillers to certain patients, and then the addiction rate, it tends to go up and up. And it has created thousands of deaths within the United States. Now we know that cannabis is a very huge um, coadjuvant for pain. And this might be shift in the perspective that people might have on the use of cannabis for an alternative as for painkillers or opioids themselves. Do you think the opioid crisis and the medicinal benefits of cannabis will help in the change of the legislation and the public view towards this plant? I think that that the um, that that the connection between cannabis and and a reduction in opioids is not very well known. There's actually a lot of very very solid science that shows that when people have access to legal cannabis and affordable cannabis, that the rate of opiate consumption, the rate of opiate prescriptions, the rate of opiate overdoses, the rate of opiate addiction, all drop um, quite significantly. Um, but this science is not, it's not very well known. It's not very well publicized. And, um, and I think that that's, that, that that's really um, something that should change um, because I think a lot of lives could be saved. Unfortunately, you know, in the, in the few places where, where people have really tried to introduce cannabis as therapy for, for narcotics addiction, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of pushback, um, uh, and the recovery community, um, even though many people within the addiction recovery community clandestinely use cannabis and understand that it's a helpful substance, within the recovery community itself, it's it's kind of a taboo subject. Not many people are willing to talk about it. So I think there's a lot of work that has yet to be done um, uh, publicizing the the beneficial effects of cannabis relative to opiate addiction and opioid addiction. the California sober narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the 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 you know California sober it's you know it's a it's a new term but it's an old phenomenon. It's the way that I've been living my life um, my whole life and it's you know we had to learn that for ourselves because you know, when I was growing up, I was told that cannabis was this horrible, terrible, addictive drug that was going to make me crazy and do violent, terrible, depraved things. And then, and then I, I tried cannabis and I found out that that was a lie. Um, so I couldn't trust anything that, that was told to me. So I tried everything. I tried every drug that there was. I was, I was already in the underground market. I was already buying weed from people who had other substances. And I tried every substance that was out there. And over time, I, I learned what worked and I learned what didn't. I, I learned that, that if I stuck to cannabis and I stuck to psychedelics, I stuck to 
mushrooms that I was going to be good. I was going to be safe, that, um, that I would be able to enhance my life and enrich my life without hurting myself. But I also learned that if I did alcohol, if I did cocaine, if I did opiates, if I did speed, that I would really get pretty screwed up pretty quickly. Um, uh, and, and so we learned what worked and, and, and what doesn't. So, you know, there's a few definitions of Cali Sober. For me, Cali Sober does not include alcohol. It just includes cannabis and, and psychedelics. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's what works for me. There, okay, so um, you know that many of the resistance that comes from the general public when it comes to viewing cannabis as something other than you know an addictive drug. It's you know there's always this cliche of it's a gateway drug. If you try it, you'll try other drugs. Now that we're in the effort to legalize um, not only medicinal cannabis but adult use cannabis, it it sometimes is a bit confusing because you're trying to bring effort and shed some light on the benefits of cannabis as a, you know its medicinal properties. And then at the same time, we're trying to have another part that is trying to legalize its adult use, but it could be, I don't know if it could be at some point confusing for future generations as to how to view the plant. Do we view it as something strictly medicinal or is it something as with any other substances that we can, you know, have a bit of fun with it and it won't harm you as much as others. I mean, how, how do you approach this whole education part of it for future generations? You know, the people that are going to be, you know, the next generations that are going to be growing up and, and seeing both sides of, of, of cannabis. So what I would say to future generations is that you really need to understand the medical cannabis uh, idea at more as a political strategy than as a way to actually look at the plant. Um, in my view, there's not really such a thing as medical cannabis or recreational cannabis. Um, in my view, all cannabis use exists on a spectrum of wellness. Wellness includes using cannabis for things like cancer and Alzheimer's and epilepsy, really grave diseases. It includes using cannabis for chronic conditions like depression and insomnia and, and chronic pain. Um, uh, it includes using uh, cannabis for, you know, transitory elements like uh, like indigestions or migraines. Um, but there's a whole other range of wellness uses of cannabis that I call the overlooked wellness uses of cannabis. And a lot of people think of these things as just getting high. But I don't. Right. I'm thinking about the ability of cannabis to extend patience, to spark creativity to wake up a sense of play, to teach us to resolve conflicts more peacefully, to bring us in closer touch with nature, to um, encourage self-reflection and, and introspection and forgiveness um, and empathy and compassion. For me, uh, this isn't just about getting high. It's, these are some of the most valuable experiences in our lives, you know, the way that cannabis can help a painter find the right color, or a poet find the right word, or a musician find the right note, or turn a walk through a park into a spiritual experience, or an argument into a discussion. Those things are all wellness. It's not about getting high. It's not about intoxication. It's not about escaping. Um, it's about enhancing and deepening our lives in very meaningful ways. So I look at cannabis uh, 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 all cannabis use, unless it's misuse, I look at it as wellness use. That sounds lovely. And you said misuse. How would you label the misuse of cannabis? So uh, you misuse cannabis. I have a simple three-part test, right? One, why are you ingesting cannabis right now? You should, you should be able to name a reason. Maybe it's, I'm getting ready to eat a meal, and, and I know it's going to taste better if I smoke some weed. I'm getting ready to make love. I know it's going to be better if I smoke some weed, right? Um, um, uh, I've got indigestion. I know it'll go away if I smoke some weed, right? Um, um, then you ask yourself, okay, that's, that's the effect you're looking for. Is that effect beneficial at this time, right? So, um, you know, um, you certainly aren't, if you're trying to lose weight, for example, you're probably not going to want to smoke cannabis just before sitting down to a meal, right? 
So you're like, okay, well, maybe I should wait till after the meal. Maybe now's not really the right time, right? Um, uh, and then the third check is, is if you if you've said, okay, I know why I'm using it, and I know that the use is beneficial, then you just ask yourself if the if the manner and the place in which you're using cannabis is going to be disturbing or harmful to anybody else. And and if you can answer all of those three questions, then it's not misuse. It's use. And if you get any one of them, if you get hung up on any one of those questions, well, hey, maybe you should think about it before you light that joint. Agreed. That's a, that's a, I'm going to start applying that test from now on. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, thank you for that answer. It was uh, really entertaining. Now, um, since uh, um, our company has been focusing on education and it's a path we've been wanting to take, um, what are the possibilities um, for cannabis education to bridge the gap to higher level education? Let's see, uh, for cannabis education, uh, becoming a bachelor's degrees, a master's degrees, for it to be taken more seriously than um, just, um, let's say, the stigma for the hippie culture and everything um, that's got to do with that, for it to become a more uh, of a medicinal, pharmaceutical, chemi chemistry type of um, education. Do you think we'll be able to bridge the gap for it? Oh, it's happening already. Um, so I'm I'm right now uh, working with the Medgar Ever called Medgar Evers College here in New York City, where I'm speaking to you from. They've just developed a 13 course cannabis curriculum, uh, offering a two year certificate um, uh, in cannabis studies. Um, uh, that uh, curriculum has just been approved by the state of New York, and they're teaching their first semester of students right now. Um, and, and that is just one of, I can tell you, there are at least another 20 you know, U.S. Uh, institutions of higher learning that are offering certificates or minors in cannabis studies. And uh, these studies range from, you know, studying the, the economics of, of cannabis, the history of cannabis, to the study, to the, the science of cannabis, depending uh, on, on where these schools are. That process is also uh, beginning to get underway in, in Mexico. We don't actually have courses that are being taught yet, but we're beginning to see serious conversations um, and forums and seminars taking place in Mexican universities. And I know from conversations uh, from faculty members at UNAM, uh, at the Universidad de, de Guadalajara and other institutions in, in Mexico that they are also um, uh, preparing plans to introduce cannabis uh, curricula. So um, it is happening. And, uh, and if um, I, I, I can almost tell you certainly that if you had conversations with academics at, at Colombian universities, that they're very, very eager to begin, to begin working on this as well, if, if they would be allowed to. Yes, of course. We are already um, developing various academic programs with universities here in Colombia, and we think we're opening the way for that type of education, at least here in Colombia. Now, um, it's been amazing to have you here. We want to know, considering all your great journey, innovation, and talent, now what projects or surprises do you have in store for 2022? Well, I, you know, I, my, my main mission for 2022 uh, is, is focusing on making sure that here in the state of New York, that as legalization is put into place, that the incredible legacy operators in New York have a place in, in that system. Um, and my goal is to, is to make New York a model uh, and then to take that model out to other places uh, around the world. I think that this is the, the most critical thing that's happening in the in the world of cannabis today, and it's it's, it's where I really uh, hope to be. So uh, I don't know if that's really going to be a surprise to anybody, uh, you know, given uh, given my history and 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 what I've what I focused on. But but that's uh, that's the the mission that that uh, I'll be making my main mission. But, you know, I'm very interested. I continue to be very interested in cannabis media and cannabis media projects and storytelling. And um, we just had a, a, a kind of incredible experience here in New York with something called the Stone Age. 
um, which is a cannabis cannabis immersive um, sort of. Have you all heard about the Van Gogh immersive, right? Did, has it come to Bogota? Yes, I've I've I've, um, I've been there a couple of years ago, and it's coming back this year. It's amazing. So um, a, a couple of, uh, of, of very dynamic women cannabis activists in New York have put together something called the Stone Age, which is a cannabis immersive, <laughs> uh, like the Van Gogh immersive. I just got it. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, one of the one of the visions that I'm populating is I would love to see a Spanish language cannabis immersive do a global tour. So if there's anybody out there that thinks that's a really great idea that would like to help me make it happen, maybe that's a surprise we can unroll sometime in 2022. Well, we'll definitely get working on it. And now, Steve, it's been really an enormous pleasure for all of us. You are just a lovely individual and in all your history. We've been looking forward to this interview all week. Um, and our our readers, I'm sure, will very much enjoy everything that you had to offer. Now, as some final words, do you have some final words for our readers, which are new entrepreneurs looking for information and looking for guidance within this brand new industry? Do you have any words for our readers? Any advice? Well, I, I think that um, you are all uh, incredibly lucky to be here at this time in this place to have the opportunity to work with this plant because I am absolutely convinced that over the course of the next 20 or 30 or 40 years, what we're going to see is a, a continuing process of embracing the plant a continuing process of, of the plant being used as a replacement raw material for more and more products, for it really assuming a major role in, in, in medicine. Uh, I think that, that we are going to see a spiritual revolution. We're already beginning to see a spiritual revolution that's connected to the use of cannabis and, and other visionary plants. And that process is, is going to continue. So my advice is get ready to take your place in the sun. Think big, don't think small. Remember that you can make almost anything on this planet out of cannabis, almost anything, paper, plastic, fuel, food, housing, clothing. There's probably no limit except for our imaginations. And, and so, so think big, um, embrace this future, be bold, don't be timid and, and know that, um, that you're part of a process of reclaiming uh, that has started some time ago and will be going on moving into, into the future. The success of that, the, the, the future of our world really depends on that process. So embrace it with all the energy that you have. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been an amazing pleasure to have you. Don't forget, if you ever come back to Colombia or are passing by Bogota, make sure to contact us. We'll be more than happy to give you a tour. Um, Anna, do, do, do you want to add something else? No, just, again, immensely grateful for your time. And it's it's been um, enlightening and fun. And as Maria Jose said, you are a lovely person. I... <clears throat> wanted to ask it's just I mean it's been such a fantastic um, meeting and of course we this is going to be for our edition that's going to go out on the 30th of course we're going to be emailing you that edition we're going to be um, you know tagging on social media I had a question about the video is there any way we can use the video or do you just prefer us to you know limit it to print because I feel that the video also captures a lot of the essence of, of you know of the conversation no, you can use the video. I don't think it's the it's the it's not the best lighting, and my voice isn't in the greatest shape today. But it's, but lovely. Yeah, it's sure. lovely, and your house it really looks very homely and well decorated and much taste. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, uh, I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, sure, absolutely. Feel free to use the video. Thank you very much. Now, um, without um, anything else, then I wish you have a wonderful evening. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to interview you. It's been nothing but an amazing experience. Thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day.
Well, thank you so much. It's been delightful to spend some time with you and as well. And I look forward to the next occasion and hopefully meeting up in Bogota. Of course, you're very oh much welcome. Have a wonderful evening. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you.